Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching. This is EAR, End All Racism. It's on the American Doofus channel. I'm Barry Walsh. Normally, you can find me on the American Doofus show. But tonight, EAR, End All Racism, we're talking about the future of race. And people have asked why I began this movement to try to end racism. And um, it's because race is not something that's taught. Uh, I'm sorry, race is something that's taught. It, it's not something that's genetic. It's not like a, a disease, but yet it is a disease. Mm -hmm. And we are in times of COVID. And we know that we can end disease. It was created by man. It can be ended by man. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All we need is to have the will and to find the ways to come together in peace and unity. It's just that simple. <laughs> Good evening to Star. Good evening to Comedic King. Thank you for joining tonight. It's simple. We ended it. It's over. No more racism. <laughs> Well, Barry, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> so, I we'll see you all next time. Thanks for joining. <laughs> <laughs> we do need solutions. We need solutions. We need to do better. And I think uh, um, solutions might be a function of tonight. Racism is a choice. In 25 years, according to the Census Bureau, white people will be a minority. Um, so there's going to be fewer white people and, and more people of color. Is that, um, uh, to me, that's a positive when it comes to peace and unity. Um, but in the, uh, in the relatively near future of the next few months, um, I'm not as hopeful as I am as if we can get through uh, if we can get through this coming year, if we can get through the warm weather, um, not only with COVID, but with racism, um, it's, a, uh, it's a major problem in our country, in my opinion. What do yeah, you I, 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 that's exactly right, Barry. I, I uh, was actually thinking on, on the way in here, uh, kind of where we are as a country, we have we have to deal with COVID. We have to deal with the, you know, a very um, negative former president and all of the backlash and the repercussions from that. And on top of that, we're just in this deep lull, having to deal with a divided country steeped in racism. And um, and I actually think the construct of color, along with the construct of race, has a lot to do with that. And so solutions around getting people to see one another as human beings um, and, and not as a color or not as a race or any other quantifier, I think that is gonna be one of the major functions of this group and, and of this mission. And if I can add to that, um, I just wanna be very clear. Uh, Donald Trump ripped the Band-Aid, <laughs> the very thin Band-Aid off of racism in this country. And you had them all coming out the woodwork. Um, and anybody who doesn't see that, I question if you're paying attention. Uh, get your head out of the sand, okay? Because at the end of the day, now we know who, when, what, <laughs> why, okay? And we've been, been able to identify that with our, you know, with our former administration that has left the White House. So uh, I think we know where the current status is, and I think we know where the future is headed because of all these people showing their face and showing their true colors and showing their true sentiments on how they feel about black and brown people, okay? Yeah, and, and at the same time, we can't lump everybody together because not every single Trump supporter was a racist, but uh, every racist was probably a Trump supporter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the words of, of the great Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, there, there, there are two things. There's sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And so I think at some level, people that fell for the okie doke in this last administration following um, just an insane, almost dictatorial 
leader or their leader, uh, I, I think a, a part of it was conscientious stupidity, just not being a political animal and thinking that because the office of the presidency stood for something. And so well, he's president, he must be, must be right. right. You know, there were those people. And then there was that, sin, well, that was sincere ignorance. But then that conscientious stupidity that allowed people to say, well, you know, I've always thought that about black and brown people. So he must be right because he's the president. So I'm just going to go along with it, you know, and I'm going to expose myself. Um, you know, how do we get that genie back in the bottle? Right. In terms it, of and Star, I was just thinking about when you was talking, I was like, we went from open, wide out in the open racism to now we're back to subtle in the closet racism. Right. So let's be right. clear. Biden is no better than Donald Trump. And I don't care what anybody says because his history and politics speaks for itself, okay? This man has done more to harm the black community than Donald Trump did in his four years or even in his you know, business life. So let's be clear about one thing that in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, everything that we say on here is personal opinions, okay? In my opinion, Joe Biden is no better than Donald Trump. Um, they all are in, put in office to pretty much uphold white supremacy and to uphold classism, to you know keep the rich rich and keep the poor poor. Okay, so you got racism and you got classism that's being practiced, and you know the American people will so we're so blinded that we think that the two party system has any different sentiments about those two subjects. <laughs> it's the same subject matter. I'm sorry to tell you all. They, mm -hmm. old parties want to make sure that they stay rich and they want to make sure that white people are the supreme of the supreme of the United States of America and the world. Now, how do you all feel about that statement? Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with you on some levels. Uh, the institution of America is, again, is, was born it, under the guise and un, under the construct of, uh, construct of racism. So it can't, this two party system is, is a distraction. Just, just this tribalism and the tribalism that goes with it is a distraction. If we talk about America as a one united, when people say United States, I always think in my mind, we're not that united <laughs> because of states rights. You know, this whole idea of states rights and the states can do what they wanna do. And that's on every level. That's judicially. That is, um, you know, it, it, it just permeates every level of that state governance. And so how they conduct themselves and ultimately they fall under some level of federal law, but they, they have carte blanche to do to people and with people what they will. So until we really solve that problem, um, it is, I think you're absolutely right. Even though we have two parties, the agenda is the same. And that is to maintain the status quo of white supremacy or the ideology, the disease-minded ideology of white supremacy in this country. Yeah, that's why I said the other night on uh, one of the lives, I was going to start the uh, NFAP, uh, the not effing around political party. So, uh, you know. And and be careful, Barry. You might get a hit put out on you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just joking and, and it was not meant to any offense to anybody or anything like that. Uh, but the concept of what, uh, what Grandmaster Jay put forward, I think needs to be put forward in politics. It's well, time, that's, that's it's already time, been done. It's time that for was, a different movement. Yeah, I agree, but that was the Tea Party. Um, they they kind of started out. And, they did, and they ended up hijacking yeah. the Republican Party. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, more power to them. Um, who's to say we can't do the same thing? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, you know, I, maybe... I, I tried with Bernie Sanders. Uh, we tried hard. Yeah. And, and, it, and it was multicultural and, and multi class and multi um, age, uh, everything. You know, I mean, it was the gamut and um, uh, the. The movement, the movement got stopped by the powers that be. So I know right. exactly what you're talking about. Kim. Yeah. So I, I think that exactly I think that we, I think that we should not look to hijack to be effective. Not look to hijack 
any of the two old relics. Um, they already have all of their contagions and contaminants. Oh, absolutely. Start with a fresh party based on some of the tenets that Bernie Sanders put forward and based on just a, a, a justice system and laws and, and, and uh, guidance around how to treat people humanely um, should be the gist of, of this new party, whatever it is, yeah. but just not any of those two relics. Okay, now, now just while we're on to this, um, is politics the answer or is it is the answer groups like, I mean, politics is obviously the answer, answer for long-term peaceful change. Um, but what I should, I shouldn't say politics. Let me, let me reframe what I'm asking. Is the government going to be a help or a hindrance in, in unity and equality? Or is it going to have to be groups like us doing it as citizens, as human beings, as individuals to actually really make any changes? Well, Barry, when you talk about government, government originally started off as for the people, by the people. Okay. You had. Your it was for the white landowners, by the white landowners originally, but it yeah. wasn't written that way. But that's how it, that's how it started, to be honest. But now it's turned into for the corporation, by the corporations, for the elite, by the elite. So I think that any progress that we attempt to make on unity, on um, equality, is going to be rammed down by government, so-called government, because they are not for the people anymore. They are for the corporations and they're for the elites and they're for the mega, mega wealthy of the world. So. Um, the answer is not government involvement. The answer is political involvement, uh, but we have to find a way to group our power together as one, okay? Right. When I group our power together as one, yes, I'm talking about black people. We all, and Claude Anderson, he talks about this. I'm the, that's my guy, okay? I'm sorry mm -hmm. to talk about him a lot. I've read that's other books, right. but that's my guy. He has, in my opinion, uh, the best solution to today's ills um, that is up to date. Now, yeah. I haven't seen anything that's better, but he talks about, um, and I haven't even gotten to his Powernomics book yet, but he talks about this in um, Black Labor, White Wealth, that Black people need to abandon both parties. We need to have one party that is specific to our problems and our issues. Because guess what? Jewish do it. Spanish, every, every group in America does that. Every group across the country does that, except for us. So when you talk about your original question, yes, I think political party, at least on the, the smaller basis when we talk about black people. Now, we can expand that to political power for the larger group, also for unity, because I, I think it, it's fair to say that most Americans want the same fundamental things that they wanted when the country was started, okay? Um, now, just leaving out slavery, most Americans, they want, the opportunity to life, liberty, and it used to be property, but pursuit of happiness, okay? We want that. And if we go based off of that fundamental fundamental um, ideology, then I think that we can tear down this classism and racism system. Okay. All right. Now, you mentioned earlier that um, the nation needed to be repaired. And, and specifically, um, the black community needs to be repaired. Yeah, so just moving along here and getting to the subject of solutions, because who wants to talk about problems all day? I want to talk about- Well, we, we've got to identify the problems so that both, right. so, so that everybody knows- Right, and we do know. a good job of doing that. Oh, we do a good job, yeah, we do. And <laughs> we had to do it. But now we, get, now we got to start, to, now we got to get better. Now exactly. we got started. Now we got because because there's too many people on both sides that just want to kill each other. Exactly. That are ready ready for the fuse to be lit. Exactly. White people want to start killing black people. Black people want to start killing white people. And I don't say that as an alarmist or an extremist. I say it because I hear it too often from both sides. Right. And we need alternatives to those right. kind of things. Right. So well, let, let's, let's look at the construct of, of, of why that is. Let's look at why those things happen and why that is. 
we we are a part of a, a greater government that in which corporations get to vote. And so of course they have more money and they're going to advocate for themselves. They're going to lobby for themselves. Meanwhile, you have 99% of the people that live on the edge of poverty and they're paying taxes into a system that really doesn't give a rat's crack about them. So um, people are frustrated, people are hurting. There's a lot of trauma out there. And so when we talk about you know pulling ourselves up by the bootstrap, Sometimes the bootstrap is, is already tied. It's tied in a knot and there's no way to really uh, unhinge yourself from it or free yourself from, from the, you know, the construct of it. So, I mean, we have to look at that part of it too in terms of government. Um, people can't raise themselves out of the mud if the government keeps pouring mud into it, basically. <laughs> I love that, Star. Um... So Barry, to, to kind of, you know, answer your question about solutions, I think just starting off, the only way, and this is, this is, no, there's not, there's no left or right, it's just one way, the only way to repair race relations for all groups, because, you know, there's more than just black and white in this country, but the only way to repair race relations in this group is you have to repair the dark, ugly history of slavery to black people, nobody else to black people. How do you do that? Well, yeah. the number one way throughout history, at least the past 200 years in America, the number one way that you've done that is through what we call reparations. When I look at the definition of reparations, it says the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wrong. Now, let me ask you as a, as a heterosexual white male, Barry. Yes. In your opinion, has the United States ever, and I just named one, ever righted that wrong in any type of way? No, no. They started to. Uh, they started to after the Civil War um, in the original Reconstruction concept, but that became exploitive uh, rather than than aidful. Um, so. In all honesty, no, um, I don't. I don't think they're, um, and and every tiny little step of what is called civil rights uh, has been fought for and and bled for and died. For. It, nothing has been given. Right. <laughs> nothing you know, has been given. In my and opinion, I, and you know, I'm just trying to keep it a hundred. Mm -hmm. And ironically, um, that that reparations that was the 40 acres and a mule and the freedom of black people after reconstruction, the freedom of black people to move about and join political parties and things like that. That got squashed Absolutely. really quickly. And guess who got the reparations? Um, the people the that slave lost slaves, the, yeah, owners, the former, former slave owners. owners. They gave them reparations for the slaves and the labor lost, basically. Yep. Yeah. And uh, under Jackson, so I mean, it's, it, it, you know, it's been an uphill battle for centuries, even today. And when we look at modern day policing. Yep. And when you talk about that star, I'm glad you mentioned about the 40 acres and a mule. Um, in 1860, Charles, well, in the 1860s, it was more like 1865, 1866, Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens, they actually went before Congress and they said, hey, Blacks are either going to be free or they're going to be enslaved, okay? And they said, in order to be free, minimally, you have to give them 40 acres, a mule, and $100, okay? So the first Civil Rights Act in 1865 had that in there. And guess what? Abraham Lincoln, he got assassinated, and then Andrew Johnson came in, okay? Southern and, sympathizer. And, exactly. And as soon as he saw that bill, vetoed. We don't want it. Get it out of here. So they had to go back and they had to rearrange it and they had to make it, they call it less, uh, less um, extreme, okay? It, it couldn't, it had to use big and big, amb ambiguous terms such as all people and um, the American people, okay? They couldn't do anything specifically for blacks. So they had to take that out. And then that's where you got your first civil rights act. And who did the civil rights act need to be passed for? Black people, but black it people. wasn't aimed yeah. for black people. So I think when we talk about um, history and how 
pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. You can't pull yourself up by the bootstraps if the straps was never given to you in the first place. Right. And or if the straps I, are tied to an anchor. Exactly. <laughs> right. When I, look, when right. I look out through history, every group in America, from the Japanese, from the Jews, from anybody who has received federal benefits or reparations, they have gotten that for the same premise that we should be getting it. And in my opinion, I don't know if this is anybody else's opinion, but if you really look at look out, you know, from the 1600s up to today, I think we've probably been done the the most wrong. I think we've been the most wronged out of any group that has received reparations. Now, would you all agree with that statement? I, I mean, absolutely. When you, I mean, the inhumanity by which America has treated black people in this country and still does the inhumanity that and, and the affliction of hatred that's been imposed on black people in this country. Um, it, it's a, it's, it's amazing that we have not gone before any tribunal, um, the, the, you know, United Nations in, in, or the, just based on, you know, world, just the hatred. I mean, we, it's amazing. We haven't gone, America hasn't gone before a tribunal and it hasn't because we fund too many nations. We have alliances with too many nations. And so when you talk about um, bringing up war crimes against the United States, people are like, oh, I can't do that, you know, because they're the undergird of my economy really. And so uh, we're just not gonna deal with that in this, in this cycle, you know? So that's what's happened to, to our, uh, the appeal of the world and what's happened to black people in this country. And so people just look away. And then so in later years, we, we're just looked upon as troublemakers and, uh, and, and that's global, that's just global because we're asking for, you know, for our freedom and we're asking for respect as human beings. And that's a travesty in and of itself. And Star, you just keep, you keep me on the path of straightness and greatness. I love it because you brought up something else that was next on my list. So let's talk about the 13th Amendment, okay? I talked about that last week and I talked about how it had that loophole in it, all right? So, you know, after we received um, our, you know, our freedom, our so-called freedom, what did the American government do? They turned around and they put a loophole in that bill that said, you are free unless you are a criminal. And see, that's when we get the black codes that was enacted in the South that said, as much as looking at you know, a white person wrong, you're back in slavery, buddy. And then, you know, um, this still exists today, you guys. You know, this is something that still exists today. So we're technically still slaves. And people don't think about that. Technically, slavery is still being practiced. And then meanwhile, in the North, they introduced something called the Freedmen's Bureau, okay? Everybody thinks the Freedmen's Bureau was this awesome thing for Black people. But guess what? That, that also put us back into semi-slavery and pillage, okay? So, you know, that brought out the sharecropping uh, program that pretty much once we got out of slavery, we had the tools, we had the skill to be able to farm and do everything we needed to do to support this multi-billion dollar industry called cotton, okay? We could, we could literally run the farms ourselves, but they said, no, 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 no. We're not gonna let you all obtain any wealth. We're gonna let you work under a white plantation owner and you can share crop and you can work for him and you got to sign this contract. And if you don't sign this contract, you're going you're gonna to get hauled off to jail because you don't have a job. And that's, that's against the law, okay? So yeah. we just have to understand the tricks that have been laid yeah. in the landmines that have been laid the past 300 years. And if you follow the trail of tricks, you can understand why black people are in the predicament that we're in right now. Absolutely. And why the angry and, and, why, and, why, and why there's so much anger. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, you brought up a great point about, about the Freedmen's Bureau. There was the Freedmen's Bank. And the Freedmen's Bank, people, Black people put their nickels and dimes together uh, to the sum of roughly $3 million, which was a wow. lot um, in that time. And they had a, a board, uh, a share member, a board member, a white guy that took the money and invested it in what he thought was a good investment, another white man's business. Of course, they lost everything. People around the country, black people around the country lost everything they had. And the US government would not hold them accountable. So that's the, the type of institutional ingrained 
hatred and racism that we have to get over that hurdle. Not we, we black people, I, we don't have that problem because it's inflicted upon us, but that's the problem. And that ideology and that less than, that's what white people need to get over. Like, like uh, Toni Morrison said, leave me out of it. <laughs> white people are gonna have to get, they're gonna have to get themselves together and figure out and understand this history and understand why we have the angst that we do and the trauma and the mental illness and all of those things and start one, acting as human beings and then treating people that are not their same skin color, stop looking at race and color and start treating people as human beings. You know, um, an example popped into my mind while, while you all were talking. When I was, um, when I was a kid, um, a quarterback uh, started for the Washington Redskins in the Super Bowl and he was black and it was a mega controversy because I grew up hearing on, on national television that the black people are great athletes. They're just not smart enough to play quarterback in the national football league. I heard those very words. Okay. And Doug Williams proved them wrong when given the opportunity. And then, and now we have advanced in the last 40 years to where there are a, a ton of excellent black quarterbacks in the NFL. My point being, isn't the most powerful thing white people can do is just get the GTOF, get out of the way? Absolutely. Keep be quit being a hindrance. Isn't that the most powerful Absolutely. thing that white people can do? Other than, I, and I want to ask this seriously, would it matter if white people said, hey, we're sorry, man, none of that, you know, I've done that a few times on the show because I just, I feel it in my heart, you know, that I'm, I'm horrified by our history and what we have done when it comes to race. You know, I'm proud of a lot of things America has done, but I'm ashamed of, a, of, of more. Very. I think with that problem. sentiment has to come action. Um, oh, right. There yeah. are, there are people that will like, oh, well, you know, we're really sorry, even the NFL and it's sorry excuse in the way it treats, it treated Kaepernick. Um, oh, we, yeah, you know, Kaepernick we want to end racism and um, we're proponents of, of, of all inclusiveness and things like that, but yet they still um, created this offense against someone that was merely trying to stand up for his humanity. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's the, that, that institution the undergird of it has to be, the legs have to be cut from under that. And Barry. And yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you can finish. No, and I was going to say, I think the, the power structure, um, this power structure that, that promotes white supremacy and that is, that is just steeped and rooted in, in white supremacy, the legs have to be cut from under that. And, and I don't think it's as easy as people saying they're sorry because people can say one thing, but when it comes to their pocketbook and when it comes to their economies and their ability to feed their families and things like that, if they can gain, gain an advantage over another human being, they're going to do that in a system that is structurally um, disinterested in including everybody. And Barry, um, to answer your question earlier, I think if white people mainly stops practicing cognitive dissonance about the problem of racism, I think will be, a, that'll heal half of the problem right there because the problem is people have a disconnect between their ancestors and them, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, uh, my, my, even if, you know, cause this is what I always get when I talk about reparations. Well, you know, I didn't own any slaves. Yeah. You know, I didn't own any Native American slaves but we still pay Native Americans. I didn't take any Jews and put them in concentration camps, but we pay reparations to them. Uh, I, you know, it, you have to look at Japanese. all of these- Japanese, yeah. Yeah. You have to look at all of these incidences throughout history and you have to, you know, 
you just pretty much tear down that disconnect. And you got to connect the two. It's, it's not about what you did. It's about what the group did, okay? Or what the, um, the majority did, okay? Because in, in America, we operate on a group basis. So if the majority, which is a group that represents a group, did something, you are part of the problem and you will have to be a part of the solution. So I think the sooner that Caucasians mainly, because they're the ones that hold all the power in this country, I think the sooner they realize, oh, damn, my ancestors did do that. And they still have a lot of systems that they refuse to tear down that's hindering the black community. I think the sooner they can realize that and be like, okay, well, how can I help? Instead of saying, oh, well, that's not my problem because I'm not racist. Okay. But you're going to allow all of this to continue. Right. I'd say because they benefit from it. Exactly. Exactly. And that's yeah. what, that's what, um, Claude Anderson said, he said, you know, you might not have owned slaves, but you benefited off of the systems that was built off of the back of slaves. So, it, there, you know, I think the first thing that, like I said, that white people have to do is they just have to come to terms that those two ends meet and there is a connection right there instead of thinking there's no connection between me and slavery. Yes, there is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think another thing too is is just getting rid of some of the uh, iconography and getting rid and and we're trying people are trying to do that but getting rid of some of the uh, the dialogue and the words that promote division that promote race that word white supremacy I do not like that word because one people I think use it in the wrong context and so when I say white the ideology of white supremacy and the disease of the, uh, the diseased ideology of white supremacy. That's how it should be constructed. This whole idea, when we say white supremacy, um, you know, we have to fight white supremacy. It's almost like you're, you're quantifying it as real. You're, you're legitimizing the fact that you're white are supreme. That's right, white that's supreme, right. White supremacy. So I would love it's, to get rid of that word. That's an interesting concept, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. We can rename it and call it as the system of racism. Let me ask you something, both of you. If because there are there are black people that that hate all white people, are they considered racist? Or can it depends, you on, it depends on what definition you use. There's a definite, you know, there's there's two separate definitions for racism. One of the definitions is um, being able to impact another group based on the power that you yield. Um, so in that effect, no, they right. would be technically considered prejudice. Right. Um, and some other definitions say that racism is pretty much prejudging somebody based off of the color of their skin. But at the end of the day, that's not racism, that's prejudice. So I don't think, um, based off of both definitions, I don't think it's possible for Black people to be racist. I haven't fully got on board with that idea just because there's so many, you know, different definitions on racism. Yeah. But I think the general term is no. Um, they can be prejudiced, but they can't be racist because they're prejudging. Because they're not impacting. Person. They're not right. impacting the minority. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Or they're not impacting the majority in this case. So right. you have to be able to impact the minority and by definition, mm -hmm. technical right. definition. Okay. So I have a little different take on that. I think if you, and I don't care who it is, if you hate someone because of the color of their skin, and even though it's the color of their skin, even based on the things that they've done to you, i.e. Black people hating white people, um, that level of hatred, you can be prejudiced, I think, and, and be, you know, not like someone and be prejudiced, but to just hate all people because of the construct of racism in this country or your experience with white people um, and vice versa. Um, I think the same thing for white people that hate all black people because of something they've experienced or what they've been told. Uh, I, I still think that that's racist. I, I think because you're basing your hatred on, on race and the color of someone else's skin. Okay. And that's exactly why I said I couldn't get on board fully with that idea that black people couldn't be racist because it's it's a you know it, it's kind of one of those things where it's left up to the reader to determine. Um, I, you know, it, it's it's a funny definition actually, and it's a definition that hasn't really been alone that that 
been around that long. So it's changed over time. And, you know, I, I, I get a lot of, um, you know, these black pro, uh, these black activists that say that all the time, but then, you know, I just think about it. And I'm like, but it's always that, but, but, and that's why I'm just like, I don't, I, I understand, I feel you, but I don't know if I would use that in an argument. You know, somebody said, well, you're racist. I'm not going to say, well, I can't be racist. I'm going to say, well, explain. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I agree with Star that, it, you know, it, I, I think it really just boils down to what you define as racism. And some people define racism as judging somebody based on the color, off the color of their skin. So, yeah, and I'll give you an example of that. And I, I've, I've, I've struggled with this a little bit. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up in the projects and uh, my parents were not well to do. And, but I was an athlete and I had a white couple from Alabama of all places. Um, I was at a basketball game one night and they were like, you played a heck of a game. And they introduced me to their family and thing, and they literally kind of like adopted me. Um, I still consider them a part of, of, of my parenting um, uh, from, from way back. And they are some of the nicest, kindest people in the world. And they love me. They call me their daughter. And the whole family calls me their sister, their brother, things like that. And I have often said to them, and now, but there's a part of me that has seen the way that my people have been treated, that black people have been treated globally and the way that I've been treated in this country. And it really makes me despise some white people. I have to be honest about that. Yeah. I'm just keeping it 100, like Barry says. But I say to them, and we joke about it. I said, you know, you guys are really the only reason I like white people. <laughs> and you guys gave all white people hope for me because I said, there are some really hateful and mean people and, and even in their own family. And we have really honest dialogue about that. And we, they ask me how I feel about certain things and we talk and it's just really, really nice. But the construct of that relationship is human. It's, it's, it's being human, it's humanity. Some of the most beautiful people in the world. And, but, but I still have a struggle with people that don't conduct themselves that way. Right, right. And yeah. Barry, so, just, just to clear the air, I do not agree with that sentiment that, um, you know, I hate all white people. No, I'm like, listen, okay, because if nobody knows, you know, I, my fiance and the mother of my children, two beautiful girls, she's Caucasian, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and, and just to bring up another thing too, you know how people say, well, I can't be racist because, you know, I have a, a black boyfriend or whatever. Yeah, you can. Because I definitely, just like Star said, I look at some white people crooked and sideways, and I'm like, "Boy, you better be glad it's illegal." To <laughs> so, you know, just to to you know, on another subject, yeah, yeah. You can. But anyways, um, you know, I, I I just don't agree. I think you should give a person an opportunity to show you who they are, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you, should, you know, yeah, their, their the, the contents of their character off of their actions. And that's why I mm -hmm. said Joe Biden is a piece of shit because, you know, his actions up to this point is the only thing that I have to go off of. Yeah. Not his words, his actions. And it has not showed me anything different. So um, I, I, I totally do not agree with that sentiment that you should hate all groups of people because of your experience with one. And, and I had to catch myself too because um, I, used to, I used to drive Uber. Um, this was a few years ago. This is when Uber was really the hot, the hot thing to do. And um, I used to get a lot of rude Indians, um, like from India. Uh -huh. And I told, she was my girlfriend at the time, I told her, I'm like, I can't stand Indians. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, damn, am I being racist? Or am I being racist? <laughs> and I was. So I had, I had to control myself because I would go into a situation not I, I pretty much was doing what white people would do that were racist. I would go into a situation not even knowing who this person is with the thought that I'm not going to like this person. I'm not going to like this person. I'm, and the first first chance I get, I'm going to validate that by whatever they do, even if, exactly. yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I had to get rid of that and I had to change my attitude because, you know, that is the whole issue of America today is that we go into situations prejudging. Absolutely. Like, you know, experiences with just a, a shitty person yeah yeah but you know the danger too um I, I having traveled and the danger of the way 
America treats African, Africans in America, the danger in the way that it has historically treated black people, that, that, that permeates globally. It, it perpetuates itself globally. Um, I've been to China, I've been to Vietnam, I've been to Thai, you know, all these different countries. I've been to, to Russia, I've been, I've been around the world. And the way that people will uh, either treat me as though I'm invisible or they'll, you know, they'll point or it, they, they treat you as like you're, they wanna take pictures with you, they don't ask. And it's almost like you're, uh, you're entertainment for them or you're, and they're very rude. You know, I've been to, to it lived in Italy for a couple of years and people there, there are some people there that until I spoke English, until I spoke and they understood that I was an American, they treated me as though, you know, or you hear them say, oh, those Africans, those Africans, they treated me as, as less than human. So the way that America treats black people in this country permeate, it follows us wherever we go in the world. I am a witness to that. So if we really want to make America great again, we need to eliminate racism. Oh, Barry, make Absolutely. America great. Not again, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry for the maggot reference there. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but then we have to say great for who? Right. Great for who? When was it great for Black people? Now, just because we had a Black president, that, does not, that did not make, make America great for us because we still okay. had all of these problems that we've trolled or in, we trailed into our lives and into the fabric of our lives that we still have to deal with systemically in this country on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I actually think that the election of President Obama made it worse for Black people. And, 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 and I think Trump was a result of that. Mm -hmm. White people were like, oh, never again. We'll never have a Black president. <laughs> oh, uh-uh, no, no. We're going to do whatever we White can. House. That's right. Yes. We don't even want a black cloth in here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, you know, that fabric. There that, are some that believe that. that. There are some that think yeah. exactly that way. We're, we're never going to have a black person as a president. We're never going to have a woman as a president. Yeah. And the two yeah. most vilified people are Obama and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And, and Kamala Harris is going to end up being president of the United States despite all the hatred. And that's still kind of ain't going to you know? do a damn thing. For well, I mean, she may not, but it may be all symbolic, but it just might energize enough younger people to go, you know, you know what, maybe we can do something. It's possible. It's you know? possible. Yeah, I think that's already happening. That's already happening. And, and, and that's what EAR is really about. We've always said this is about the future. It's, it's not about us. It's about our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids and and having peace and unity. Yeah, well, you know, before we go, can we talk about can we talk about policing mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things mm -hmm. and how we how we need to try and get that under control so that we can try and have some healing in this country? Absolutely, of course, yeah. we should talk about that. Yeah, and I I bring that up because again, the whole construct struck the the financial system, the judicial system, and how that does not work for us, how it does not, how it has left us behind and left us out of that, um, out of the grand scheme of things. Um, unless we have, and this is my belief, unless we have, we get rid of qualified immunity, and unless we make every police in this country have to requalify for their job, that means records review, they need, someone needs to, uh, be uh, I think they need to be um, a uh, outside of the uh, outside of policing independent they, independent, independent investigation reviewer and assessment and under federal authority all of all of policing and all of those rules need to be under federal authority and they have to requalify for their jobs if they have things in their record if they have and and I think that if they have things in their record that are identified as criminal they should have to go to jail. They should have to have their own insurance or have to pay when they disrupt someone else's life and it's found yeah. and they're found to be uh, unlawful in That's doing so. Yeah, Dick, Dick Gregory said that, didn't he? About, I think, uh, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, that, that, but that's, that's been swimming out there for a long time, even now in some circles. Um, we just need a total reset of policing in this country because of the history of policing and the construct of the FOP mm -hmm. and the construct of those unions it has always been based and steeped in 
you, looking at um, black people as less than human. And I'm not saying that there aren't good cops, but the institution as a whole is shitty. Yep, it's almost. And I've I've heard it said, and I'm I and I, I was going to investigate it, and I never did. Um, I heard it said that that black police officers have their own um, police organizations because they're not part of of the white unions. Is that? Have, have either one of you heard anything like that? I heard so, it from you. you yeah, I, I can say I have experience. I have a friend that's in Noble, the uh, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement. And there's a, a group called Noble. So that's one group. Um, I think Black people are a part of the greater union, the police union, and a part of FOP. But that's starting, a lot of them are starting to break off from that because they're not getting what they need. And they're still a part of this they're being victimized even within the system mm -hmm. on a lot of different levels. So they're finding that they have to get themselves out of those organizations to even have some level of solvency in, in the offenses that are that are even created or made against them. Yeah, and, and Star, to piggyback off of what you were saying about the system, um, it just needs to be completely demolished. Every single thing that we thought, because see, I'm a, I didn't finish college. I, I, and I always say I'm gonna go back, but for what? Because <laughs> you know I, I own two businesses right now, so what was the point? But uh, you know that was my major was criminal justice. At one point, I wanted to be a federal agent. I experienced systematic racism that turned me completely off from policing, and I said I don't want to be a part of the system. I was in Columbus, Ohio, one thirty in the morning. Just came from Cedar Point with my girlfriend, my old girl, ex girlfriend. Great roller coasters at Cedar Point. Great roller coaster. Oh, Sandusky, Ohio. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I was just sitting in the parking lot, and you know, I had went to the hotel that we thought we had because we was gonna go to the zoo. And guess what? Guess what part of Ohio we was in? Uh, Columbus. Northern <laughs> Columbus. I don't know if it was north or south, but we was in Columbus. Okay, and we was gonna go to the zoo that morning. Uh, my hotel reservations apparently didn't go through, so I'm sitting here one thirty in the morning, uh, between twelve and one thirty in the morning, trying to find a new hotel. Police, they not, oh, two white cops, no Lamar, Hauser, I, I'll never forget their names. German, strong German names, knock on my door. And they start asking me questions. Well, you know, the second question, not even a how's your night going, nothing, that a second question out of his mouth. Any drugs, firearms, or anything I need to know about? And I'm in the police academy at this, well, not the police, I'm in the application process, okay? And so I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I'm fine. You know, we're safe. We're we're blue. You know, I was brainwashed. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I didn't know it was illegal for you to have a loaded firearm in Ohio without a license. So I said, yeah, yeah, I got my, you know, my firearms right there. So you know, he had me step out the car. You know, he went through the motions. They were super respectful. Got the gun. He gets on the phone. I'm like, what, what's going on here now? He's like, well, you're not supposed to have a loaded firearm without a license in the state of Ohio. Well, I'm like, well, in the state of Kentucky, you can. I'm like, so I'm like, why is this a big deal, you guys? I'm, you know, I'm in the police academy right now. I'm doing all this. Whoop, 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 whoop. They didn't care. The detective was like, yeah, but bring him down here. I want to interrogate him and I want to make sure that the gun doesn't have any bodies on it. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> so, you know, that was a clear um, experience of systematic racism within the policing community. They assumed first of all, that I had drugs and guns on me, they further assumed that there was a body on the gun and that the gun was a stolen gun or a dirty gun. And, you know, I got dragged through the, you know, through the system. I had to pay all this money. I wrote a letter to the mayor, to the police commissioner, no response. Um, and then, you know, I had to take a, a misdemeanor plea deal because it was a felony. I'm like, okay. So after that incident, it completely turned me off. And that's when I said, and that was just one of the answers. There was another one that was worse where I had a gun drawn on me and I was only 19, but um, for the sake of the time, because I know we're running out, you know, that is the system that needs to be torn down. You know, they have to look at every citizen equal and they have to look at every citizen as I'm here to protect you, the person I'm in front of, but they don't look at it that way. They look at, I have to protect the white community. Or mm -hmm. I have to protect mm -hmm. the overall community, which is always white, Asian, whatever. And 
you're typically who fills our prison systems. So you're typically who I'm going to pull over, harass, you know, try to find something, sometimes even plant something on you to fund that privatized prison system. So, you know, that was my experience. And, you know, that's why I believe it just needs to be completely torn down. Yeah, it needs to be overhauled. It definitely needs to be overhauled. And, and, and I'm hoping that there is talk in the Black Caucus and in the White House and wherever else that conversation needs to happen. But, you know, that police union is so powerful and the lobbyists are so powerful for the police um, that it's going to be really, really difficult to get any kind of change from that perspective. But it, it has to happen. Um, there should be um, th this human rights violation that you would murder another human being without without probable cause on video and then be able to walk free that's it's almost like america is saying to the world yeah we kill black people over here what do you guys do with them <laughs> you know so i mean it's 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 dangerous for us to be here and it's dangerous for us to go elsewhere because people have that same mindset the united states is the greatest country in the world you must be the problem sure. and that's how they treat you that's how they act right and if we don't have conversations like this and if people don't understand, you know, it, it, I'm sorry, if we don't have conversations like this, there's no way for people to understand the feelings of others. By having these conversations, we are educating, we are exposing, we are opening up to, uh, to, to try to inform that, that we can get through these things, but we've got to recognize what's really going on. And, and Marie Justice just joined us. We're getting ready to close. Marie, how are you? I'm good. I'm doing good. We're getting ready to end for the night. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was at nine. <laughs> it was at eight. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. All right. So we thought we thought something had happened to you. Or you yeah, some we bad thought you didn't have electricity or something. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I'm don't so be, sorry. It was just, be. it was totally my bad. I was off on the time. Don't, I'm don't so worry. sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Mary, Mary, we got to start exchanging numbers and, and, and shooting text messages. Yes, That's right. Yes, we do. And we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that. Marie, we'll see you. Thank you, Star. Thank you, Comedic. Okay. Thank you to all of you out there watching. Um, we greatly appreciate the viewers. Please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing. And uh, especially uh, if you want to, if you want to communicate with us in the comments, um, just leave a question for one of us or yeah, one of us in particular, you know, leave a question for King, leave a question for Star, leave a question for Marie, uh, for myself. And uh, we will be back next Wednesday uh, doing this all over again on the um, American Doofus show. Uh, it is um, E-A-R, End All Racism, and uh, we want you to be a part of it. We're going to have information on that, information on t-shirts, uh, information on all kinds of stuff coming very soon. And until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, replace hate with love, replace hate with love, Re replace uh, distrust with uh, an open mind. And if I can say, be your best human today and every day. Yes. Comedic, yeah. you got a closing comment. Uh, my closing comment is just to keep your eye on the enemy. Okay. <laughs> and that's, that goes for all of us because we all have a common enemy. Amen. Marie, you want to say something at the end here? Mine would be, uh, be the light that you want to see in the world. Don't wait for someone else to be it. You choose to be it each day. Well said. I'm going to end with this. Racism is a choice. Make the right choice. Take care of yourselves. It's EAR, End All Racism. I'm Barry Welsh. Until next time, good night.